way behind the eight ball. So we want to be able to do what we've been doing in the past. We want to give at least a thousand book bags out, school supplies to these students. And so we need you uh, to give us your wholehearted support uh, during the course of this week. We have boxes set up outside and uh, you can bring them and put them in the boxes or you can just take them right there um, to Mount Mother Human Services um, and Marie will receive them, will receive them, receive them there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lincoln and Sharon Hines, where are they? I can't see them somewhere. So where's Sharon? There she is, right where she normally is. Lincoln is. He is over there. They celebrated, uh, they're celebrating their 29th uh, marriage. Sunday, but Dr. Thomas Walker, I want to congratulate him on, on, on being uh, one of the top uh, uh, educators in 2018. Someone wrote, we cannot correct what we are unwilling to confront. However, we must, we must know who we are confronting and what's their agenda. This past week, uh, group of pastors, for those of you on social media you know what I'm talking about. This past week a group of pastors met with 45 to discuss what many of them thought was a continuation of a conversation of some work that they had previously gone to the White House to discuss and that was prison reform. I've spoken with one of them and came away from our conversation, believing that his and other men who went to that meeting believed their motives were pure. He and others have a genuine concern, like most of us do, particularly for those of us who are in the trenches, about we have a genuine concern about prison reform in America. Genuine concern about the school to pipeline, school to prison pipeline agenda that is prevalent in this nation. Genuine concern about men and women who've gone to prison, who've done that time, served at that time, and come back home, and particularly in the state of Florida, cannot and have not had their voting rights restored. We're one of the very few states in this in the nation whereby ex-offenders do not have voting rights. And so people went, some of them, went thinking that they were going to continue a conversation and continue to talk about legislation that had to do with prison reform. I believe, however, 45's agenda was totally different. He used it as a, as a, as a photo op to be, to be used later to show his concern about the African-American community. 
do believe that some of those brothers who were in that room, at least one or two of them knew what their agenda really was. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, by their fruits, you will know them. In Luke chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, for every tree is known by its own fruit. A tree is known by the fruit it bears. I may not be a fruit inspector, but I do know what fruit looks like. And I know if I go to an apple tree, I don't expect orange. And so, it really doesn't matter what 45 said to these brothers and sisters if there were some in the room. What matters is the fruit he's bad, he bears. Children separated from their parents at the border, children being locked up in cages, that's, that's his fruit. African nations and third world nations being called assholes by this president, that's, that's his fruit. Stood up for the racist in Charlottesville, Virginia, that's his fruit. Seeking to reduce funding for public education. That's his, that's his fruit. Attacking anyone who disagrees with him. That's his fruit. Leaving this meeting with pastors and the next night, the next morning, tweeting attacks on LeBron James and Don Lemon. That's his fruit. LeBron James started the school. Yes, he did. He got sued because his school was a farce. That's that's his fruit. I can go on, I can go on and on about this, but I don't have time. But the thing is, as I said to one of my brothers, you don't sit at the table. Someone whose fruit is as bad as 45. Without speaking as a prophet of God. Moses didn't compliment Pharaoh when he went back to Egypt. He confronted him and said to him, Let my people go. Nathan didn't compliment David. Come on. When he confronted David about his sin, yes, sir. he just pointed him out as the man. Yeah, yeah. He's a man. Elijah didn't compliment Ahab yeah. when he announced the drought in Israel. Yeah. Jeremiah, Micah, none of them complimented kings when they were in the wrong. When these prophets showed up, they had a word from the Lord, and most of them suffered the consequences for their actions. These brothers, some of them, are having to deal with the repercussions of not speaking truth to power on that particular day. Instead, we heard sound bites of them complimenting the president, thanking him for being so wonderful. So caring for all people. And as a result of that, these pastors are being maligned as coons and uncle toms and traitors to their communities and their churches for praising the president. And what's more troubling is the fact that many people, for many people, the litmus test of, of, of our love for our community is to attack these brothers. I refuse to do so. I love, I, I, I have nothing but love for all of them because I believe, except for a couple, I believe they went with pure motives. But what has happened with this, in this particular matter, it has divided our 
many church it is dividing pastors, it is dividing the Christian community, it's dividing people of faith, calling people, causing people to decide whether they want to take one side or the other. And the only person that's benefiting from this is 45. I would suggest that we all pray for one another. Pray for these brothers. Because many of them today, rather than uh, preaching the word of God, are not having to do damage control. And I don't know how long that's going to take uh, for them to be able to overcome what has taken place at that meeting. And so I'm saying today that we have to be very careful with whom we meet. And when we do meet, we need to make sure we have an agenda. We need to make sure that the next time, I guess, when they will, will have gone, uh, they will take their own agenda with them uh, so that they will not be looked upon uh, in a bad light in our community. I'm concerned about our nation. I'm concerned that while 45 is doing a whole lot of things to distract us, while we're distracted, some people are distracted by the fact that LeBron James started a school and Jalen Rose just happened to talk about the fact that he had started a school in, 19, in 2011 and there are those who took his statements to believe to say that LeBron, that that there's a, that he's jealous of LeBron James and all of that kind of foolish. While we are caught up in that kind of stuff, 45 in his, 45 in his group, I'm trying to put together a group of people to try to change the Constitution of the United States. While, while we are arguing over stuff like this, 45 in this group are working to, uh, in many instances of, over a period of time, Probably dismantle public education. We have to be. We have to be. We have to. In the place, see people are saying we got to stay woke. We got to understand what the what the what 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 the, what, what, what the rules are, and we have to understand what's happening in our nation. Pray for our brothers. Pray for their churches. Many of them taking some hits that I don't believe they deserve, but pray for them, uh, and uh, that God will whatever their agendas were. Whatever their motives were, God understands that. God knows that. And whatever consequences they have to deal with, that, that's what they're having to deal with. But uh, we just want to make sure that, 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 that you understand where I stand on this matter. I believe that, that 45 uh, uh, and others uh, used some of these brothers, and uh, now they're having to deal with it. And that's something they have to deal with. Our responsibility is to pray for them. Amen. Amen. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, I'm trying to be quick with this. Psalm 32. Verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. It says these words, Blessed, or blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent till my bones grew old. Through the roaring, through my ro groaning all day long. Night and day your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave my sin. Then he called. 
closes that verse with that word, Selah. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you again for blessing us to be in this place today. We're going through some tough seasons in our nation, in our state, in our community, in our church, in our homes. But God, we know you know. You know, Lord. Everything that is happening in our lives. And, and God, we know that you are already at work. So that everything that is going on, you're going to sweep it into your will for our lives. And we can end up knowing that all things do work together for good. For those of us who love you those who are called according to your to your purpose God we pray now for our churches we pray for the church community we pray God for those pastors who right or wrong spent time meeting with the president. Who's heard to say just wonderful things about, about him in the midst of all that he and his administration are doing right now. You knew their motives, you know their hearts. Now God, we pray. that you will work a work in their lives and in their ministries. And whatever is happening in that situation will turn it to your good. God, we pray for every person in this room today, in this sanctuary. Because there are those who have already come to the altar, but they and those who didn't come who have needs that only you can, you can supply. Come for come for asking your blessings upon Tanisha. Upon 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 Joe. Pray for Talia, we pray for that family the entire family. We pray for Laverne, Deborah, Deidre. Good God, we know you are healer. And so God, we count it done in the name of Jesus. We believe you for a miracle. We're walking by faith and not by sight. So today, we cast all our fears, all our hurts upon you. Because we know you care for us. In the name of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be your sanctuary. Be seated. Pure and holy. Thank you. 
thanksgiving. I'll be a living. to the extent that your soul prospers. The psalmist said, God will not withhold any good thing to those from those who walk uprightly. Uh, he says that, that uh, uh, God gets pleasure, Psalm 35, uh, 27, the B clause, that God has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have that more abundantly. So when we accept Jesus as our Savior, when he, he, he gives us eternal life and brings us into a right relationship with God the Father. However, in addition to eternal life, God wants us to enjoy an abundant life right here on earth. The devil has many Christians fooled into thinking that God wants us to wait until we get to heaven before we receive blessings from God. Somehow God wants us to just barely get along. That God wants us to struggle here on earth so that we can be rewarded when we get to heaven, but the devil is alive. God, God, God will bless us right here, right now. God desires for us to have blessed marriages, blessed finances, blessed businesses, blessed relationships, and whatever else it is that pertains to each of us. But there are some pit, pitfalls to success, or to the success that God wants for us. One of them is not knowing how to handle uh, uh, setbacks and mistakes. One of the hindrances to, to, to our blessings right here is, is us not knowing how to handle mistakes and setbacks. I don't care who you are, I don't care how saved you are, you will have some setbacks. You, you will have and you will make some mistakes. You see, being born again does not exempt you from making mistakes. Being born again does not exempt you from having uh, uh, lapses uh, in judgment. Things will go wrong. You will sin and go contrary to God's will for your life. Yes. Say it again. You, the things will go wrong. Yes. And you will sin and uh, go contrary to God's will for your life. 
Well, maybe I don't. Maybe, maybe I need to change that statement and say, I will sin and I will make some mistakes and and go outside of the will of God for my life. Since I'm since I'm the only one seem to be willing to to say something about that. But how you handle your mistakes? Oh God, how you handle your setbacks? will determine whether you succeed or fail to live a life of freedom or condemnation. And when you read the Bible, when you read the Bible, you will discover that with the exception of Jesus, none of the heroes or sheroes of the Bible were mistake free. Can I get somebody in <laughs> Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. Abraham lied about his relationship with his wife in order to save his skin. Moses killed an Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. David committed adultery and murder. Peter lied about his relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul held the coach of those who stoned Stephen and then proceeded to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. You see, none of us, brothers and sisters, uh, are, are exempt from making mistakes. However, yeah, we, we do not have to allow our mistakes to keep us in bondage to the past. You see, some people never learn from their mistakes. And they keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Some people are so filled with guilt and shame that they can't move forward. In Matthew chapter 27, Judas betrayed uh, the Christ and was overtaken with guilt and shame. He then went out and hung himself. I, I, I believe that if he could have just made his way to Jesus, if he could have just repented and asked for forgiveness, the Lord would have forgiven him and given him another chance. Because the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Instead of going back to Jesus, he went out and carried out his own death sentence and hung himself. And so Judas is a classic example of a person who mishandles mistakes, setbacks, and even sin. If you don't handle them correctly, guilt, shame, and condemnation will overwhelm you. But Paul says... In Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Period. I wish I had somebody. Now I know the redactors added, uh, the redactors are added, you know, those who walk according to the spirit and not of the flesh. That, though, though, that was not in the original language. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Period. Can I get somebody in here? That ought to call somebody to say amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. You need to get this verse deeply embedded in your spirit. Because whenever you make a mistake, whenever you commit a sin, the devil will come immediately to keep you from confessing your sin and receiving forgiveness and putting that mistake behind you. So instead of running to God, instead of running to Christ, Many people run away from God. 
instead of running to the church, they run away from the church. Can I get somebody here? Instead of running to other believers, they run away from other believers. Because the devil has, 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 has made them uh, 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 so, has caused them to be so co uh, condemning of themselves. That they lose sight of the fact that Paul said, you're in Christ. There's no condemnation. Can I get somebody to You can run away from God. That's your choice. You can choose to live in shame. Or you can choose to be forgiven. And God, watch this, wants you to choose the best of the two options. Which one is that? Uh, Bishop, choose forgiveness. Uh, 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 you, ought tell, you ought to tell somebody to choose forgiveness. Uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. He says, I, I, I've set before you two choices. Life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life. Can I get a witness in here? He says, since you got a choice, life and death, choose life. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in shame when forgiveness is available. Can I get a witness in here? Hey, David, David, David tells us how to deal with setbacks. Hey, his, David committed two of the worst sins anyone could, 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 could commit. He committed adultery, and to cover that up, he committed murder. Rather than repenting and confessing his sins, he tried to conceal his sin, and he paid a dear price for it. But David soon found out that unconfessed sin produces problems in three areas of life. One, one in the physical realm. In the physical realm. Look, look at what it says in verse 3. It's right here in verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. David said, David said, when I kept silent, when I did not confess my sin, when I tried to hide my sin, my bones grew old. David says, he became like a young old man physically. Are you praying with me? David also said that he was groaning. This word refers to uh, the cry of distress. While David's sin was unconfessed, there was something inside of him crying out in distress. When he tried to keep his sin from being found out, something on the inside was taking a toll on his body. Can I get a witness in here? David says, when I, when I, when I tried to hide my sin, he says, my bones grew. Oh, he says, it, it, it affected me physically. I, I believe, I believe there's a possibility that there are some people who are going to the doctor and the doctors can't find really anything wrong with them. And when the problem is unconfessed sin, I'm just going to ask could be a problem. You're walking around with unconfessed sin and something is happening on the inside. You can't figure it out. But it affects us physically. Preach Bishop, I'm giving them the best shot. Not only did it affect him in the physical realm, it caused problems in the spiritual realm. Look, look at verse 4. The A calls for night and day your hand was heavy upon me. This referred to the chastisement of God. Now, whether you believe it or not, God would discipline his children when they refuse to deal with sin 
in that life. <laughs> See, Tom, I, I, it says, the, the, here's what the Bible says. For whom the Lord loves, he chases and scourges every son whom he received. Oh, my God. Why does God chasten his children? When there is unconfessed sin, here's some things that happen. Your prayer life is hindered. Can I get somebody? Yeah, yeah, your prayer life. Some says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not heal me. Your prayer life is hindered. Your shout is gone. Your power is absent. And your appetite for the things of God is gone. And so God says, I got to get you back on track. Can I get some, just like my daddy used to have to discipline me more than I, I more than I really cared to have been disciplined. And the manner in which I had to be disciplined. Because he didn't know but one way to do that. He didn't know about time. He didn't know about sitting down and saying, "Now, Clarence Edward, you know this. Uh, you know this. What you did was wrong." Uh, and Clarence Edward, I want you to. I want you to understand that if you know you can't do, keep doing this because there will be consequences down the road. He, he didn't. He didn't go through all of that. He just had this belt that he got from the sawmill that had little holes in it, and he was just hung the boy. And all he knew how to do was tear it up. He let it tear. Holiness and righteousness. 
He means to miss the mark. It's, it's like an archer shooting an arrow at a target, and the target is there, but the arrow goes here. It means to miss the mark. It doesn't say how far you miss the mark. It just means you miss the mark. And is there anyone here today who has missed the mark? Means to miss the mark. I, I'll answer for you. I know I'll answer for you. All of you. At one time or another, have missed the mark. Second word David uses is transgression. Refers to man's defiance. It means to step over divinely assigned boundaries. And we commit transgression, watch this, when we know something is wrong and do it anyway. It, it, is, it is willfully and rebelliously disobeying God. Isaiah 53 verse 6 to 8 clause says, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. I know there are some of us in here today who are guilty of stepping over boundaries that God has placed in our lives. God said yes, we said no. God says go, we said stay. God says don't, we said do. Whatever God says, we did just the opposite. We knew it was wrong, but we did it anyway. Somebody here. We knew it was wrong and we did it in it. They do not have it in it. Real Christians. I, 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 know, I know some of y'all don't want nobody to know that you've done some stuff. You know, y'all saved and everything. But that, that even since you've been saved, you knew it was wrong and you did it anyway. You knew it was wrong and you said it. Can I get a witness? Thank you. I'm almost finished. The third word David uses is iniquity. And if you notice these same words he uses in Psalm 51. This word speaks of man's distortion. This word means that which is bent or that which is crooked. It means to twist out of shape. It, it, it really refers to our natural bent toward evil. Our old sinful nature is naughty. And is always striving to do that which is wrong. Uh, we, we are naughty by nature. And can I get somebody in here? In your sinful state, your sinful nature is always striving toward that which is wrong. And if you read Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 25, you will see that Paul was struggling with the same problem. Paul says, when I would do right, wrong is that, evil is that. Can I get somebody in here? He says, and if I do that which I don't want to do, and don't do what I want to do, it's no longer I who does it, but it's the sin that is within me. on the inside of us that strives toward sin. There's something in us. Something within. Something on the inside. Can I get a witness in here? You know what it is? That sin for nature. Well, let me close. How did David 
did David deal with his sin? How did David deal with his transgression and his iniquity? How do we break out of the fog of guilt and shame for, for those of us who do have some guilt and shame? Yeah. And let me just throw this in. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're gonna put a little, I'm, I'm not going to put a quarter. I'm just going to put a nickel in the meter in the words of Christ. Uh, if we have, if we, if we can continue, continually practice sin and, that, and, and there's nothing on the inside of us that bothers us, that's a mighty good sign that we, that, that's a sign of unsalvation. That's just a sign. That, I, that's just one of the signs. I'm, that one salvation may not be a, may, may not be a word. But the bottom line, y'all know what it means. That, that means that there's a possibility you don't know Jesus. There's a possibility the seed of God has not been implanted in your life. But the Bible says those of us who are born of God cannot continually practice sin. And if you can continually do that which you know is wrong and you have no regret. And, and you don't have any feeling of remorse, something is wrong with you. You need to be saved this here morning. David. Your sin. God 
does not hold those sins against you. People will, you might, but God won't. I wish I had a witness. I mean, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God does not account, God does not reckon those sins again. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. In other words, there are no more barriers between us and God. We can come to God and come into his presence and we can enjoy fellowship with him because there's nothing that stands in the way of us and God. Are y'all tired? Can y'all handle one more? Not only does sin, not only does confession bring cleansing and closeness, it also brings consecration. Watch this. Look at the B clause of verse 2. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Oh, y'all got, y'all, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. This means that we're no longer trying to pull the wool over God's eyes. When we confess our sin, we're just straight up with God. We ain't trying to lie to him. We ain't trying to cover up. We're just straight up with him. Can I get somebody in here? We just tell God, here it is. This is what happened. This is how it happened. This is what I did. And this is the reason I did it. And no matter why I did it, I was wrong. And I'm coming to you. And I need you to forgive me. I repent of it. Give me another chance. We are honest with God, and our whole life grows more holy before God when we are honest with God. We're not trying to pull the wool over the eyes of God. We're just telling God like it is. We're telling God what it is. I wish I had somebody in here. We confess our sin. Well, we gotta go because we gotta do the Lord's Supper, observe it, and then we gotta we gotta leave. Here's what happened to David. David got his shot back. <laughs> so y'all need to read. So you have to read Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 together. You read Psalm 51 first. And then read Psalm 32. Can I get a witness in there? I ain't got time to go back over that. That's your assignment. When you get home, read Psalm 51 first. That's when David is crying out to God for forgiveness. Psalm 32 tells us what happens when we are forgiven. I can't get no help in here. David got his shot back. He was able to praise and worship God again. Because while he was sin was unconfessed, he was alienated from God. He didn't feel a closeness to God. Can I get a witness in here? That's the reason David cried out in Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. David says, My joy is gone. I don't feel a closeness to you anymore. And so he cried out, restore unto me. He cried out, create in me a clean heart of God and renew the right spirit within me. But when God forgave David, here's what David said at the end of Psalm 32. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice you righteous. And shout for joy. Are you upright of heart? When you experience God's blessing. When you experience God's forgiveness. It ought to cause joy. In your heart. Can I get 
and a witness in here. Your head ought to be raised up. Now your feet ought to get light. Can I get a witness in here? Somebody in this house this morning, you just might need to experience the forgiveness and restoration of God. You need to get back to the place where God, His Word, God and His church meant something to you. Do what David did. Confess your sin. Bring them to the altar. And you can leave here today telling everybody that I came back from a setback. How did you do it? I went to God. I stopped telling my friends all about my trouble. And I went to God and told him about my sin. And God But be a witness for me when you went to God and confessed your sin. God turned it around. God changed your life. Can I get one witness in here? God put running in your feet, put clapping in your hand, joy in your soul. Somebody say yes. Yeah.
we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That's what you can say in chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Period. Give God a big, big hand. Yeah. 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 Yeah.